It seems like the warmer climates are the only ones that are privy to these perennial crops that allow you to harvest endlessly until the end of time. But the truth is that there are some cold climate perennials or plants that you can utilize here in a zone three or something in and around that zone because all you truly need is a better plant strategy, not necessarily a longer growing season. So scrap the cold frames, scrap the low tunnels and the fancy outdoor heaters. Let's talk about a list of plants you can strategically place in your cold climate gardens to allow you to have continual harvest and limit what needs to be started indoors. Now, the benefit for me starting this video here in January is that we don't have to buy them. We can actually start them here now in January, February. So we've got lots of time to get a perennial that not only is going to be producing this summer, 2026, but something that's less expensive because let's face it, perennials are expensive when we buy them for nurseries direct. Now, if you don't know who I am, hi, hello, my name's Ashley. I am the fearless leader of what we like to call the geek crew. The geek crew is anyone who has hit that subscribe button and usually comments down below. They will give you relevant information for your area. Lean on that. Seriously, lean on that. That is real life, true experience, and it is irreplaceable and way more valuable than some crazy redhead speaking to you on the screen. But with that being said, this list, because of the fact that I am an absolute plant and soil science nerd, is based on plant physiology and not Pinterest vibes, which is something that I am terrible at. I am a massive tomboy, so the idea of Pinterest boards makes me want to vomit, if we're being totally honest. There are ways to still be creative and visual without Pinterest, and that is today's sponsor, Skillshare. I've been using Skillshare for several years now. I even have a course on Skillshare about seed starting specifically. And essentially, it is a massive library of creative classes taught by very real humans and professional humans for that matter. We're talking designers, illustrators, makers, entrepreneurs, lifelong experience, and many different walks of life. And the best part is that is got zero AI generated anything, which is unfortunately a very real issue. I actually found a class very recently on visual planning and creative documentation, which allows me to look at things such as planning out a garden and what I'm putting where more visually, which I am more of a visual learner. Now, the best part about this is I'm not just being spoken at with it. There is actual projects that you need to complete and post. And this allows me to get the critique I need, or it holds me accountable to actually putting the new skill set I learned to the test. You learn by creating, sharing, and receiving feedback, which is exactly what plants do to you, but this is faster and in real time from real people. So if you're looking to reconnect with your creativity here in 2026, or you simply just want to stop the doom scrolling, then you want to check out my link down below. The first 500 people to use my link in the description or my QR code here on the screen will get one month free of Skillshare. Thank you so much for sponsoring today's video. Now let's jump into the plan list. So number one is crown and root storage perennials. Many of us know there's root vegetables out there such as onions, carrots, beets, rutabaga, turnips, you name it, that have storage systems underground. When you're in a colder climate, that tends to mean that things are going to survive and thrive a little bit better because the ground is not as cold as complete exposed tree and plant limbs. So the first category is kind of those crowns, roots, and shoots is actually that crown root perennial world. Number one is asparagus. Now there are several different varieties of asparagus. And ultimately speaking, these crowns are where a lot of the storage system takes place. The beautiful thing about asparagus, if you've never grown it, is that you have six to eight weeks of continual harvest. We're talking every day there are just new spikes popping up, and it's actually shocking how quickly that this happens. Once the spikes tend to get thinner in nature, like maybe the size of your pinky, that's your sign to stop because your plant now wants to just focus on photosynthesis and refueling those crowns that are underground. But six to eight weeks means around a month and a half to two months of harvest, which is, in my mind, 
pretty continual and a large volume, particularly if you're looking to freeze these guys. The other one is actually rhubarb. So rhubarb, technically speaking, is more for the stems and the edibility. Edibil is that a word? I don't know. I made it a word. The stems of the rhubarb is what you're eating. The leaves themselves are toxic. You also don't eat the roots, the crown of the plant, but where the plant regenerates from is from that crown. So that's kind of why it falls into this category. There is, again, a ton of different versions of rhubarb, but they definitely need these cooler climates in order to become the full-fledged rhubarb that everyone knows and loves. This one is kind of contingent on your taste and desire, but one that is a plant that just seems to keep on giving is horseradish. So this is definitely an underground tuber type plant. And let's just say she's spicy, but it's great if you're looking to combat some cold, looking to eat healthier. I don't know if you've ever done like beet relish, but beet relish has horseradish in it. 10 out of 10 better when you grow the horseradish from home. Not to mention the leaves themselves are actually very flashy and they to me, they look tropical. It looks like a tropical plant. This stuff grows anywhere, literally anywhere. At the farm, it grows in the ditch. It is an absolute tank when it comes to being able to establish and thrive in a cooler climate. Next category is the cut and come again leaf machines. Now, this list is not exhaustive, but it is kind of the easier ones you can go with. The first one being lovage or lovage. Everyone says I pronounce it wrong. I don't care how you pronounce it. It's essentially celery. It's a giant perennial celery plant that can be grown in these cooler climates. Same flavor, same texture, slightly smaller stems than maybe like your Utah type celery. But nonetheless, it regenerates and you just keep on harvesting off that bad boy literally from till the, the frost hits. Next one is sorrel. So Sorrel is something that's really good in soups, generally speaking. It has a lemon type flavor, and this is actually due to the oxalic acid that's inside of the plant. And you harvest from this thing, same, same idea, all the way until the first frost or, yeah, the first frost hits. It's not a huge plant. It's not like, you know, flashy or particularly pretty by any stretch of the imagination but it definitely serves its purpose. Next up is perennial kales. So this, unfortunately, is not for my zone, but it is for zones just above my zone. We're talking a 4B up into like a zone 6. They tend to be woodier type plants and the leaves are the edible portion. They're debenton types is kind of the category that you're looking for, but same thing. From the moment they start to produce foliage to the first frost, you can harvest that entire stretch. Next category is what we like to call self-renewing cloners. So these are plants that just literally keep on cloning themselves over and over and over again. So you're not necessarily harvesting from the same plant every year, year after year, but it is a plant that you can harvest from a portion of the surrounding plants. As long as you leave some behind, you will have more next year. So the ones that fall into this category, you could start from seed here in 2026, but I actually wouldn't harvest from these until the year 2027 because we want a little bit of a community being built up there. And the first one is actually walking onions. So these are different from storage onions. They're different from regular onions. But ultimately speaking, it is the plant that just keeps on giving. So you harvest the bulbs, you eat the bulbs. So long as you leave some bulbs alone or behind in the soil, you're good to go. Next up is chives or garlic chives. I personally think the flowers are very pretty, but ultimately speaking, I think everyone knows what a chive is. And the fact that if you leave the mound behind, it could technically fall kind of in the greenery world as well. However, it does spread. So it will take over an area if you don't control it in some way. Not that that's a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination, but again, this is one where as long as you keep the flowers at bay and you continually harvest from this sucker, you're harvesting until sick of it that summer. So you could go till first frost, but I can guarantee you won't because you will have one too many baked potatoes with chives and you're going to be like, I'm done. I'm chived out. I think my favorite category is going to be this category and that is the fruit category. Now, there are a 
ton of options here, shockingly enough. But I will say if we're talking pears, apricots, nectarines, plums, apples, anything that is normally on a tree, I highly, highly encourage you to get a variety that was bred by your local university. So the University of Saskatchewan has a breeding program. And out of that, they have things like the Romeo and Juliet series cherries. Those suckers will produce a ton of cherries. You will be cherried out by the time they are completed. And that also goes for any of their other tree type plants. Very important because these are designed to thrive and survive in our cooler climates, which is incredibly important when we're talking about something that has below ground biomass we need to conserve along with above ground biomass, right? So make sure you check those out. But if you're not interested in searching for something like that, which by the way, if you go to a greenhouse and you just walk in, for example, like Dutch growers in Saskatoon, Regina, you walk in there, you say, hey, I'm looking for University of Saskatchewan bread apples. They're going to take you to the section that has that. And you will very quickly realize that these suckers are made for like zone two. They can go very, very low and they are high, high producers. That is going to give you the best bang for buck out of a single plant. But then you don't want to go that route. One thing to look at would be day neutral strawberries. So these are a little bit different than probably what you normally hear about. Day neutral strawberries mean that they fruit and flower regardless of the day length. So June bearing only bear in June, not because it's on a clock that says it's June, make the berries. It's on a sun clock, essentially. And the sun clock is shorter days than what we normally would experience later in the, the summer months. So because of that, we have June bearing strawberries. But if we have day neutral strawberries, it will continue to flower and produce fruit, regardless if it, we are at the beginning of June, the middle of July, or the end of August, which is where, where we want to kind of land. Raspberries. I don't think you can go wrong with raspberries. A, they're delicious. B, they're freezeable. C, they're cannibal. You can make jams. You can eat them raw. You can literally pick at them whenever you want. They're basically an invasive weed, so I will warn you there. If you don't want them to take over your garden, you do need to put them in an area that they are slightly contained by, say, sidewalk or cement or raised bend, that sort of thing. If you just put them in your regular garden, you will be pulling out raspberry canes till the end of your days, which isn't an issue in my opinion, because again, they are delicious. They have very low predation, so there's not a lot that goes and tries to steal your raspberries because of the pokey nature that is a raspberry bush. This could include husbands, kids, neighbors. They usually don't like to risk it for the biscuit because it's not a quick yank. You got to dig in there and get sliced up a little bit. So right of passage when it comes to raspberries. But again, I don't think you can go wrong with these guys. I would personally just grab some canes. I wouldn't worry too much about starting them from seed or anything like that, unless of course you have a very exotic version that you want to go with. But yeah, raspberries, hands down, great choice. Now, if you're wondering to yourself if a plant is something that would fall in our category of a continual harvesting perennial plant in a cool climate, here are some questions to ask of these plants all have in common are kind of four main things. There's a large underground storage system of some sort. It could be in the form of the horseradish, a big tuber. It could be in the form of a raspberry bush, which is a very pervasive root system. There's regrowth after defoliation. So when you pull the leaves off, if they're able to grow back in the same area, that's a sign of a plant that will allow for continual harvest. And this also would kind of play into anything that you would grow as an annual, for example, like a basil, a thyme, an oregano, a lot of lettuces, not head lettuce so much, but loose leaf lettuces, for example, all regrow after defoliation. So that is a long-term harvesting plant. Next thing is colonial reproduction. So does it clone itself? So things, for example, like tulips and garlic and walking onions, all of these things clone themselves, which allows for continual reproduction. So again, whether we're looking at annuals or perennials, and by annuals, I mean like garlic, you're gonna have to pull out of the ground and separate out and replant. 
But ultimately speaking, that is something that we can look at as buy once and have endless amounts of. And then lastly, this is more so just for the perennial world continual harvest, and that is just cold adaptations. So this again can come through very specific breeding. This can come from getting something, you know, naturally occurring in our environment. The key here is to aim for something that is either one zone below your zone or your zone dead on. You don't want to go above your zone unless you're willing to put in some time and energy into properly insulating that plant for the winter months. So if you've got long winter, short summers, this is your list of plants you want to go with. If you want to know what seeds you need to start in January, you're going to want to check out this video right here. And that video is what Google says you need to watch because they're watching you. And I will talk to you next time. Bye.